Come on, somebody. A house of miracles. Wow. First service, I came up a little too soon and had to sing with them a little bit. So Timmy had to give me the nod. Y'all, it is a delight to be here today. You guys are a sight for sore eyes. I'm glad to have all of our first-time guests and those watching online. And we serve a great God, a God of miracles, a God of power, a God of wonder. And this is a house of prayer, right? This is a house of worship, a house built on the Word of God. And so at the end of today's session, as we finalize the service with one great song at the end, we have a prayer team that have been praying for you and getting ready for today's service. And so at at the end of the service, on either sides, uh, there'll be people, couples that will We'll pray with you and believe with you about your situation, whether it's a financial situation or a health situation, a spiritual need, whatever, a family need, because we believe that God answers prayer. Come on, somebody. God answers prayer. Yes. We are a people of prayer. So we're in this series in Christ, and thank God for Pastor Jeremy's sermon last Sunday on what it means to be created in Christ. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be hidden with Christ in God. And I I know that at first glance you think, wow, I don't want to be hidden because, you know, we all want to be known. We want to be seen. We want to be recognized. We don't want to be invisible. We want to feel like our life is valuable. And so being hidden in Christ, there's some tension there. I want to talk about how that is such a great thing and there's a reward that we benefit from as Christians who are hidden with Christ in God. So let's pray and ask God's blessing on the word today. Father, we want to thank you for this gathering. We thank you for your word that is forever settled in heaven. And Lord, we surround your word today with with hearts and eyes that are wide open. And we ask God that you speak to us. Help us to see things that maybe we haven't seen before. We pray this in Jesus name. Everybody say amen. Amen. Y'all, I know that uh, we have maybe some collectors here. Anybody collect unique things? Uh, anybody? I, I used to collect baseball cards when I was in second grade. I started a baseball card co- uh, collection. Now, the deal was my wife, I, my, not my wife, but my mom, my mom would say, Simeon, I want you to go to the store and get some groceries and a few things I needed to, she, she needed to cook with. And so I would uh, get the money and ride my bike and we'd go to, I'd go to the the uh, neighborhood grocery store, which was Baszler's. And I, this was my routine. I would get her groceries And then I would stop at the counter and they had these baseball cards. Y'all remember this? The Topps baseball cards. And there was gum inside of them. And so I'd always get a packet uh, of baseball cards and I'd eat the gum and I'd see what cards I had. And and I had a, after six or seven months, I had a a couple shoe boxes full of baseball cards. Y'all, I traded these with my friends. I had some Hank Aaron cards. I think one of them, if I'm not mistaken, was a rookie card that somehow ended up in my box. Of course, in the 70s, you, I didn't think that was valuable per se, but I had a Hank Aaron card. I had a, a Pete Rose card. Uh, I had, uh, I'm trying to think of a Reggie Jackson card. Um, I had a Johnny Bench card. I, I mean, I had all the cards. And now, I was looking online just yesterday. And I didn't tell Sonia this, but I saw that some of those cards are worth thousands of dollars now. I have no clue where those cards are. Somehow they ended up missing. Well, they, what I'm trying to get is that not only did I collect baseball cards, but I also collected comic books. Anybody collect comic books? Now, when I went into fourth grade, I started collecting comic books, and my mom would take me to the grocery store, and the big grocery store, Great Scott, and they had a rack over in the corner, right close to the checkout counter. And while my mom was ready to check out, I would go over and get me uh, a bag of comic books, and there would usually be three. There would be three comic books in the bag, and so the problem was that that I didn't know what was in the middle comic book or what the middle comic book was, and so I figured out I could op- take the staples off and slide them out and look. And if I didn't like one, I'd take another package and put and and I would arrange my my bag because I thought, hey, this is a this is what I I don't want to get a, a a comic book I already have. And so I justified that, and I did that for quite a while. And then, and then as time passed, I saw that, man, three comic books is just not enough. Because, you know, I could open up the bags, and so I made, slid a fourth one in there, and, and then I slid a fifth one in there, and like, man, this is a good deal. And I, and I, I got home one night, and my mom said, Simeon, how come there are five 
comic books in that bag. There should only be three. I said, I, I put them in there. I, I wanted more. And she said, son, you know that's stealing. And I said, it is? Yes, it's stealing. And so I got in big time trouble. I learned a hard lesson that day. And so my dad marched me back to the grocery store. He called for the manager of Great Scott. And we, there, I see it just as clear as it was yesterday. He stood in the aisle and he said, sir, I want my son to tell you what he did. And he said, tell him, son. I said, I took some comic books. I put extra ones in the bag. He's no, tell him what you did. Say the word. And I just, I, I, him on, he said, say the word. He, I said, I stole two of your comic books. And he said, well, son, he said, you know, kids go to juvenile delinquency for this. They go to, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to get, and so he put, the, it was, I was scared straight. And so there I was, the preacher's kid, the comic book thief. There's a comic book thief in me somewhere. That was before I met Christ, obviously. So as, as we look in scripture today, we're going to see that we all have the proclivity, the notion, the, we have the, we, we get it honestly, if you please, uh, to take what is not rightfully ours. This is what is wrong with us. Turn to someone, say something is wrong with you. Tell them, no, don't tell them that. But the scripture says that all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of the Lord. We've all sinned. We've come short of the glory of the Lord. And outside of Christ, there is something wrong with all of us when we're not hidden in Christ. That's why we should not only confess Jesus as our Savior, but we confess Jesus as Lord. He saves us. The shedding of his blood saves us and purchases us, but his blood also protects us. He is Lord. He is, he is owner. He is in control of our lives. Because lordship, the lordship of Christ has everything to do with ownership, but our sinful nature is to take what is not ours or to pretend that it's ours for personal gain, for personal glory. So we struggle with this idea of being hidden with Christ. Because we have a hunger for glory. We, we don't want anonymity. We, we, we don't want the life that's unseen. But it, see, he, being hidden with Christ teaches us a couple things. It teaches us that we are not our own. It, it teaches us that we're God's property. And also teaches us that we're safe from the thief. We're safe from the enemy. Check this out in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read a few verses here, beginning at verse number 1. This is so rich. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. Or in other words, you're dead to self, right? It's a metaphor. For you have died and your life, look at it, your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in what? In glory. It's not a, a place as much as it is a state of existence. You will appear with him. There is a, in other words, there's a future glory that's there. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So as you read the third chapter of Colossians, you come to some pretty quick conclusions, and it seems maybe even like a paradox because, ironically, being hidden with Christ is something that should be recognized by people around us. It should be shown every day. The Christian life is not so much a secret thing as it is a sacred thing. Now, there are things in the Christian life that we keep secret. Now, scripture says we pray in secret, we fast in secret, we give in secret, and the Father who sees us in secret will reward us openly. And so we go into secret service for the Lord sometimes because we don't want, we don't want to be praised by men, right? We want God to praise us, but it's not so much a secret thing because we, we pray today in public and we gave in public, and so we do... Christian things in public. So that's why I say it's not so much a secret thing, it's a sacred thing. We, we have to almost be guardians of God's glory. We have to make sure that we're not doing things in life for our personal glory, even though it will be seen by others at times. 
we have to see this, that there is a future glory that awaits us if we can wait for it. See, this is the thing I struggle with. If I have any struggle in life is that I, I want glory now. I think we all do. We want recognition now. We want applause now. We want to know that we're doing a good job now. We want someone to say, well done now. But if we can be patient, I prayed to God one time. I said, God, give me patience and I want it now, right? I mean, we want everything now. But there is a future glory that is going to be bestowed upon us someday if we can just wait for it. That's the key. Now, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, Paul confronts many humanistic ideas that stand in opposition to Christ and his gospel. The message to the church in Colossae is really a countercultural message. And if you read it, read the book of Colossians, you see it also applies to today in our culture because there are many false, Christ, false Christologies that Paul addressed that are true for us today, false ideas about Christ. You know, we, even today we have this life coach Jesus. You know, it's a, everyone has their personal version of Jesus, right? So he's my life coach Jesus, and so I'm going to have a positive mental attitude. And then I've got the political Jesus, and if I, if I get the political Jesus, I'll get all the political candidates of my choice, and we'll be, able to, we'll be able to rock this world, right? Or maybe there's a financial Jesus, and if I get this financial Jesus, I'll get a better paying job and whatnot. Or maybe this social Jesus. With a social Jesus, I'm going to have a lot of friends. And so these versions of Jesus stand in opposition to the true message of the gospel of who Jesus really is. And so Paul addresses this materialism or this prosperity gospel that we have to be wary of even now. That is a consumer mentality. It's a humanistic mentality. And it really robs from God. How does it rob from God? It robs from God because it's putting the focus on us, not on God. Scripture says that, that all of the glory goes to God. See, when we're not hidden in Christ, and just picture with me this, if we're not hidden in Christ, we're going to be tempted to make ourselves God. Now, we won't say that, but we'll pretend that we're our own, right? We want to steal the show. We want center stage. We want all the attention. When we're not hidden in Christ... We're tempted to be like Satan. I hate to say it this way, and you know, but this is so true, to take what is not ours, ours. You know, Satan was with God in the beginning. He was in the throne room of God. He was, he was in a high place of position. The Bible says that he was a glorious angel, one of the most glorious angels in all of creation, and he was the anointed cherub that covered. Organs and pipes were built into his body. He was a walking talking musical instrument. He had tambourines. He was beautiful. It was, a, it was a spectacle. But that was not enough. He said, I will ascend. I will ascend to the Most High. So there was this pride that was in Satan. He wanted glory. God was not enough. And so if we're not careful, we can take on that same persona and that same attitude. You know, the Westminster Catechism answers the question, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And this is, it's, it shows that it's not about us, but it's all about God. Romans 3.23, I quoted it earlier, says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These are verses on the glory of God. 1 Peter 4.11 says that God in all things may be glorified. Then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, that whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do make sure you're doing it all for the glory of God. It, so, so God wants to guard his glory. He will not share his glory, but the temptation is that we become glory thieves. Uh, we unwittingly take from the glory of God by how we live and how we look at our lives. Isaiah chapter 42, look what God says. God says he says, I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. This is the, the, taken from the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh. I am the Lord. I am in control. I am Yahweh. That is my name. And my glory, I'm not going to give to anyone else. So here's, here's the big takeaway for us today. And that is we need to make sure that we live every day to put the spotlight on God. Every day. When you wake up in the morning, God, how can I bring you glory? How can I live my life in a way that it's not all about me? How can I make sure that I'm serving you and loving you? I mean, this is something that we can do every day of our lives. It's practical to live each day in such a way that would cause other people to want to serve God. To focus on God by 
how we eat, how we work, how we play, how we use money, how we talk, how we treat others. So being hidden in Christ doesn't mean that we live in obscurity. That's what I'm saying. Or in the shadows, but in a way that the light that emanates from us is really shining on God. Look what it says in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, Matthew 5, 16. Jesus says this. He says, let your light, and we all have a light, right? Let your light sh so shine before men that they may see your good works. Look, look what happens. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So as we live our lives and we're living each day to put the spotlight on God, we're waking up in the morning and saying, God, I want to bring you glory today. Well, people see how you work and the, your work ethic and your kindness and the love. And they, and they see how you approach life. And maybe behind your back they say, man, I thank God for Brian. I, I thank God for Jeremy. I, and, and you don't even know it, but people are talking behind your back and they're giving glory to God because your light has shined of your good works, but you're not getting the credit for it. God's going to get the glory. God's going to get the credit. So here's, here's our first point today, and that is your work is really God's work. You got to think about it that way. Your work, whatever you do, whatever your job is, whatever your role in life, your work, how you roll, your work is really God's work. I remember a scripture that says that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So the God in you is working with your human will for you to do what he wants you to do. So God is sovereign. He is Lord. He is in charge. Your work is really God's work. This is so beautiful. So the question is, which direction is the light shining? Is the spotlight on you? Or are you directing the spotlight to God? Who gets the credit? We were created by God made in his image to give God credit for our lives. But, it, but it, whenever we don't do that, when others are not inspired to serve God by how we live, we end up stealing and taking the credit. Do you guys know what the number one entertainment product of all time is, I mean, as far as profits, as far as, uh, you know, revenue? The number one, you think about it, the number one entertainment product, it's, Grand Theft Auto 5. Did y'all you know, you know that when Grand Theft Auto 5 came out, the, the revenue is $6 billion. Billion with a B. $6 billion. Gr more money than any movie that any movie's ever made. $6 billion. They're saying the Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to be coming out, I don't know, pretty soon. But here's the thing. I know many of you are gamers and you may play Grand Theft Auto, but the, the irony here is that with Grand Theft Auto, you can, I guess your avatar can, you can defend against crime or you can be a criminal and you get, you get immersed in this game. And not only can you steal, but you can kill, you can murder, you can, you, some people are even modifying, it's called mods, they're modifying the game and they're able to hack the code and make it to where their avatar can rape another person. And you think, well, man, crime is bad. Theft is bad. Someone breaks into your house, that's bad. I remember when I got carjacked, held at gunpoint, a gun up to my head. I remember this gangbanger held the gun up to my head. He said, give me your keys. I was in my driveway in Indiana. And I handed him my keys, and he wouldn't let me go in the house. He had been in the house just moments before. My wife and kids were, were getting ready for, the, for, for bed, and they, didn't, they thought they heard him come in, but he did, we know he did go in the house. Anyway unnerved me. I stood there. I handed my keys to him. He drove off into the night. I didn't see my car for three years. They found it in Memphis. It was, it was, the wheels were driven off of it. And, but here's the thing. You think of someone stealing your stuff. You say, that person needs to go to jail. That person needs to be punished. Also in the trunk of that car were a bunch of my wife's Hummel figurines. Any of you collected Hummels? You know that they're valuable. The one she had was from her grandmother. She got them from Germany. They were very old. So it was insult to injury to have our stuff taken. We felt violated. We were trespassed. You see, you know what's something, there's something greater than that is that when we steal from God's glory, that's worse. I don't want to take from God's glory. I, stealing from God's glory is really grand theft. When I do not see my work as God's work, when I see that it's all me, I'm robbing from God. I, when, it, when it's all me, I'm actually giving access to the thief. When I steal from God, I will be stolen from. 
This is a principle in Scripture. Adam and Eve, let's use them for an example. When Satan tempted Adam and Eve, the temptation was not just that the fruit would taste good, but it was that she would become like a God and she would share in glory, God's glory. And so she took of that fruit. Ironically, Adam and Eve were covered. They were hidden by the very presence of God in a, in a good way. They didn't see their own nakedness. But when they sinned and they trespassed, by the way, all sin in Scripture is defined as one word, and that's trespass. That's to cross the line. All sin is really trespass, right? It's the, a form of theft. You know, like adultery is you, you steal a relationship. If you lie, you're stealing the truth. So everything is, is summed up under the, the concept of theft and trespass. And so when Adam and Eve crossed the line, when they trespassed on the property that was not theirs, it immediately gave Satan access into their lives. The thief got access and stole from them, and ironically, they went into hiding. See, when we're not hidden in Christ, our lives will be lived in such a way that there will be shameful things that will come from us, and we're going to want to hide from God. See, the beauty of being hidden in Christ is that there's also protection. There's protection by being hidden with Christ in God. You know, Satan is summed up as the thief. Check this out in, in, in uh, John 10.10. 10. Jesus says this. He says, the thief, just the thief, the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we're contrasting the thief with the giver. We're, we're contrasting the, the enemy, that fallen angel that is summed up as the thief who wants to in, 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 intr, intrude into our lives to cause us to be glory thieves just like himself. But then we have the giver, the giver. The God who is the giver of all givers. The God who gave his only son so that we could become sons and daughters of God. And so Satan, the chief thief, trespassed, crossed the line, has intruded into the lives of human beings, ultimately wanted glory for himself. We've already noted that. And so for the last thousands of years, he sought to take possession of what is not rightfully his. So here's the deal. He wants you to believe that God is not enough. Pastor Jeremy and I were talking at lunch about this yesterday. That God is not enough. What an amazing concept. What an amazing deception for, for the enemy to slip in that thought in our minds that God is not enough. And so we want more. We've got to take more. When God is not enough, we settle for less. When God is not enough, we not only settle for less, but then we go into hiding. When Adam and Eve trespassed, they went into hiding. See, the gospel, when I, when, when I study the gospel, it's beautiful to me because it, it, it helps me understand right off the bat the concept of ownership, who really owns it all, who really deserves all the glory, who really deserves all the credit. And I understand Jesus is my Savior, and yeah, He saved me from my sins, but sometimes I struggle with Him being Lord or the one who is really large and in charge, the one who is in control. You think of the word Lord, you know, Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? He's Lord. Well, it has to do with ownership. For example, if you rent, if you pay rent, who do you pay your rent to? You pay it to your land Lord, right? That just means that the landlord owns that property. Well, God owns us. We are owned and operated by God if we are hidden in Christ. So the gospel is not just a message about being saved. It's also a message about being safe. Safe, safe. It's not just a message about being, uh, about being uh, purchased with Christ's blood, but be also being protected by Christ's blood. In John 10, 26, I love what Jesus says. He says, my sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them real and eternal life. Look what it says here. They are protected from the destroyer for good. No one can steal them from out of my hand. The father who put them under my care is so much greater than the destroyer and what? And the thief. No one could ever get them away from him. So I can't trespass God and, and at the same time expect to be safe from the thief. I can't steal from God and expect to be safe from the thief, in other words, right? So I, I back off of this just for a minute. Let's talk about the work that we do. We're talking about our work as God's work. One of the best works we can do is forgive. If someone has trespassed you, right? If someone has crossed the line, they've offended you, they've talked about you, they've treated you bad, they owe you, right? 
They've stolen something from you. It's a tra- the Bible says that Jesus said to pray this way. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Remember when Jesus said pray that? But he said this. He says, if you forgive not people's trespasses against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses against him. So what happens, though, is that when we forgive, when we, when we know, hey, I'm not my own anymore. My work is really God's work. This offense is not really against me. You know what? I'm going to forgive. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to love and forgive. Forgiveness releases the forgiver in your life. The forgiver. God is the great forgiver. God is the one who forgives. Here's the second point, and that is that your body is really God's body. So your work is really God's work. Your body is really God's body. This is beautiful because 1 Corinthians 6, 19 lets us know that we're not always aware of this, right? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, right? The blood of Jesus purchased us. So, there's the big so, so glorify God in your body. I want to bring glory to God by how I live, how I work. I want to bring glory to God with my body because Paul is talking about immorality in this, in this uh, instance. And so when we forget, if you forget your God's property, you're going to look for love in all the wrong places. You're going to trespass. You're going to cross the line. You're going to do something with your body that is dishonorable and shameful. When you, when, when you forget your God's property, the temptation will be to make yourself look better than you really are. And this is what we all struggle with, right? I want to get people's attention. I want to, be, I want to know and be known. I want to be respected. I, I, I want to be loved. And so if we're not careful, we can be needy if we don't know who owns us. And here, let me say this. Don't believe the lie that you are unseen. Don't believe the lie that you are unknown because an unseen God sees you. The unseen God that we have faith in, like we have faith in an unseen God. This unseen God that we have faith in sees us right where we are. When we're hidden in Christ, there is a, there's, an, there's something beautiful, there's something wonderful, there's something precious about being safe in the presence of God, hidden with Christ in God. We don't have to impress others. We're just living, living for that day where someday he says, well done. And I want the well done right now. I want someone to say, you're doing, I'm doing a good job right now. I want glory right now. I know we struggle with that. We do. Let's just be honest. We struggle with that. But hang in there. Keep working for the Lord. Keep serving the Lord. Keep, stay faithful. People see what you're doing. They may not come up and praise you, but they may praise God for you. But even if they don't see you, God sees you. And someday he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. There is that future glory we're all hoping for, waiting for. It's when Christ returns. I was so excited about coming to share God's word today. This is something that God's been working in my heart for the last few years. The third area is your money is really, is really God's money. We'll say, I made my money. No, it, it, remember your work is really God's work and your body is really God's body. Your money is really God's money. He owns it all. He owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all His. He gives us 90%. He's saying, I want you to let me have my 10%. It's just a test of our faith because a wrong view of money makes us thieves and gives the thief access to us. You don't want to have the thief encroaching onto your life and destroying your stuff and taking from you. I think when we give 10% of our income each week to the cause of Christ, it's a reminder to not steal what belongs to God. The scripture says the tithe is the Lord's. My wife and I, we look at the tithe. It's not ours. It's God's. It's really all God's, but God says the tithe is the Lord's. Well, how does this work? Well, look at God sent his son, and you can look at Jesus as if he is the tithe of God, right? He's the firstborn of all creation. The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. 
The scripture says that Christ is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So before Adam was even created, God had already factored into his economy that he was going to give his son. And in giving his son, he gets all of us as sons and daughters. So Jesus is God's tithe. The tithe is the Lord, but the tithe is the Lord's, but also the tithe is the Lord's. So when I look at money and I look at 10%, I'm saying, God, I want to bring you glory by my view of money because it's not mine anyway. In Malachi 3, 8, it says, begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you robbed me day after day. You ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering. That's how. And, and now you're under a curse, the whole lot of you, because you, you're robbing me. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so that there will be ample provisions in my temple. Test me in this and see... I love this. See if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, look what God says. I will defend you against marauders, protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against plunderers. This is the word of the Lord. This was true for God's people then. It's true for us now. There's a principle in, at play. So when I rob from God, it gives the thief accents into my life. But when I give and I'm generous toward the cause of God, it brings heaven's blessings. And so this is the hidden life in Christ as we live out our days to make him famous. Thank God for his word today. I was studying and my mind went to, I would call it the greatest event in human history. Well, there may be three. I know there's three, at least three. There's the virgin birth of Jesus. I think we all say that was a pretty huge event. The sacrificial death of Jesus, very significant event that's efficacious, powerful, saves us. But then the resurrection, that, that's equally supernatural, spectacular, amazing. The, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. But I just want to look at one right now. So the greatest, I would say one of the greatest events in human history was Jesus hanging on a cross outside of Jerusalem. Dying a sinner's death, a shameful death. But the gospel writers show that there are two guys that are on either side of Jesus. And they just happen to be two thieves. And I think this is significant. If, if it wasn't important, the writers wouldn't have put it in there. Think about it. The greatest event in human history just so happened to include two nameless thieves. What's the point? Because of a conversation that happened between the two thieves and Jesus. And so on this side, I would just say there's the, the proud, haughty, entitled thief. And he speaks to Jesus. And there they are bleeding out. Jesus is dying for the sins of the world. And he hurls out accusations at Jesus. And he says to him, he says, if you be the son of God, then come down off the cross and save you and save us. With Like he felt entitled to, to be saved and entitled to be taken down off the cross. He didn't feel like he deserved to be there. And then the other guy, this is the guy I want to be. He just, he scolded him. He said, hey, dude, he said, he said, he doesn't deserve, we deserve this. He doesn't deserve it. And then look, listen to what the, the, the humble thief said. He said, Lord, he said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Wait a minute. Hold up. There was no time for a Bible study or a baptism or a small group. No, he didn't say the sinner's prayer. This humble thief who knew he deserved to die, but the one beside him didn't deserve to die, was the Son of God. Lord, if you please, Lord, when you remember me, let me, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. So there's a coming kingdom. It's like the gospel right there. And look what Jesus said to him. And this gives us all hope. Come on, humble thieves, this gives us hope. No matter what you've done, no matter what, you've crossed the line, you've stolen God's glory, humble yourself before God. And the humble thief, he told him, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. This epic event in human history should give everyone in this room hope that no matter how many lines you've crossed, no matter how much glory you've stolen from God, taking credit for your life, today could be a day of salvation where you're reminded again of your need for Jesus. He didn't deserve to die, you did, but he took your place. 
And so today we say thank you to the Lord of glory. We should, we should all be dead in the, in the grave and, and headed to a devil's hell. But because of Jesus, because of the giver of all givers, we get to experience eternal life. And there's that future glory that awaits us. Y'all, I'm fired up about this. I, I, I am beside myself with this. I, I'm just, I'm speechless. This is the second time I preach this sermon and I'm just saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for your generosity. Forgive, forgive us. Forgive me for stealing, for taking credit. Lord, you own me. You purchased me. You're Lord. Now I want to live in such a way that I'm putting the spotlight on you. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's all stand. We're going to worship just a moment. And we're going to have a chance for you to, to pray at the end. We have some, a prayer team that have been praying for you already. Uh, a couple on this side and a couple on this side. And we're going to worship a while. And at this time, if you want someone to just pray with you on anything, where two or three agree as touching anything, it shall be done calling on the name of the Lord. So if you need someone to just partner with you in prayer, we invite you to, to come at this time as the worship team leads us into worship. Let's worship just a few more moments.